This episode of the Topcast is presented in collaboration with our friends over at Sheet Music Plus. I think I was reading that there's seven different personalities, four broader categories of you know visual learners or auditory learners or kinesthetic learners or people that just like to read and write um, things themselves. Like the same thing with the guitar students, you need to work out what makes them click, why they're here, and then adapt that to the person in front of you. Hey teachers and welcome back to the Topcast. It's wonderful that we can hang out together today for our segment with the wonderful Michael Gumley. Now this is part two in our three-part series, uh, introducing Michael to our team as our head of guitar. Now if you haven't listened to episode one, I'd strongly encourage you to do that because you'll learn much more about Michael's background uh, and how his experience as a student who only started learning at 15 has really shaped what he's going to be talking about in this episode, which is about teaching tips and ideas for teachers of all instruments. My guest today, Michael Gumley, is a guitar teacher and music educator from Melbourne, Australia, and the owner and head teacher of Melbourne Guitar Academy, and of course, our new head of guitar. I won't go into too much more detail because you can have a listen to his full bio in last week's episode. Let's jump straight into the show. Welcome back to the show for part two of our series. How are you going today? I'm going absolutely fantastic, Tim, and it's great to be back. Cool. Well, in part one, we heard uh, about your story uh, from keen teenager, um, not learning the oboe, learning guitar through university, having your injury, and then getting into bands, and then finally starting your your current studio, Melbourne Guitar Academy, and now teaching 200 or so students a week with multiple teachers. It's an incredible story. So go back and listen to our listeners if you haven't listened to part one yet to find out a bit more about Michael. But in today's episode, we're going to share some of Michael's uh, best tips for teachers, music teachers generally. So this isn't a guitar-specific part of the show. We will be looking more at guitar in part three, our next episode. So let's um, kick straight into um, Michael's given me some of his kind of key tips uh, in our email conversations uh, prior to the episode. So I'm just going to go through some of these and uh, we can use these as our discussion points. So firstly, your job as a teacher, how do you see this as being an important thing to discuss? I think um, viewing our job as a teacher as being more than just a teacher is critical to the success and longevity of your students. Um, you know, music teaching is one of the oldest professions that there is, and unfortunately, it hasn't evolved all that much since the Middle Ages. It's <laughs> your teacher teaches you something, and then one percent of his students will grow up to become teachers, and they teach the exact same way or using the exact same method. Um, you know, rinse and repeat, decade after decade, generation after generation. But you know, medicine's come a long way in the since you know the 1920s and exercise science and everything else has you know evolved but why are we still teaching music the same way our teacher taught us that their teacher taught them that happened you know throughout history so you know just in terms of things like you know mental health development um motivational theory and um, success principles and things like that or just going well there's obviously classical music and contemporary music how do we find this student and then set them up for success? So I think you have to go beyond thinking your job is just to teach uh, a student the knowledge that you know. And some people get really caught up on that. Oh, you're here for guitar lessons. Yep, here's what I know. But most of the time people aren't taking guitar lessons with you because they want to become guitar players. It's because they're seeking uh, a hobby or they need some sense of fulfillment or some venture that's going to help them improve themselves or they need someone to talk to, or that what they really want to do is to get in front of people and get noticed and get attention, and guitar is a means of doing that. For some people, playing an instrument is a way to, you know, attract members of the opposite sex, things like that. So, <laughs> <laughs> Particularly yeah, for guitar. Yeah. More for guitar than piano, I think. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think guitar is just like that. Yeah, this guitar makes me look 1% more attractive. <laughs> I, I'm pretty certain that is a guitar playing thing. Not, not exclusively, but it's a lot more popular, but... Yeah, a lot of people just accept that face value that, oh, you want to learn guitar? All right, you're here to learn guitar. Let's go. As opposed to actually going, well, what are the dozens of possible reasons that you're here and how can I best facilitate that? And it goes into the whole, you know, learning personalities. I think I was reading that there's seven different personalities, four broader categories of, you know, visual learners or auditory learners or kinesthetic learners or people that just like to read and write um, things themselves. Like the same thing with the guitar students, you need to work out what makes them click, why they're here, and then adapt that to the person in front of you. 
Mm, yeah, it's that that oh, I totally totally understand and, and and support what you're saying as well. The other thing in the traditional sense that uh, is often done if we just follow the the models of 200 years ago is student comes in, you teach them something, they go away and practice it, they come back, you correct, you fault correct, you find all the mistakes, you tell them what to do next, and they go back and do it again. And, and you're saying, well, great, that's fine, but how, you know, what are they actually here for? Um, it reminds me of a conversation I had with Dave Simon about um, why parents are so focused on practice for music versus not really focused on practice for soccer matches and drama and dance and things like that. Why are they so focused on practice? And one of the first, I'm not going to get into that episode. That's another episode. We'll put a link in the show notes to that one. If you haven't listened to it, it's one of the most popular of all time. But one of the things he mentioned was he asked teachers, why is your child learning a musical instrument? What do you want them to get from it? And none of them said, I want them to be a concert pianist or a rock and roll guitarist or to be in a band. They said, we want personal development, self-fulfillment, maybe some self-discipline skills, creative outlet. We want them to just have fun. It doesn't really matter what happens after that. Just it's about creativity and enjoyment. So right on the money, uh, Michael, and um, aligns super closely with what I've been sharing with teachers for some time now too. Yeah, and no one sets out to be a guitar practicer, but that's generally what we become. The whole focus is you've got to practice this, you've got to practice this, you've got to practice this, when the focus should be, yeah, let's have fun, let's go out and play shows, let's jam with other people. What are all these really, really fun things to do with music and all these really, really fulfilling things that we should be working towards as opposed to just the Olympics? And I think guitar, again, is one of these instruments where people can get really caught up in the technicality and trying to be the fastest and trying to scare off other guitar players with how technically proficient they are uh, as a territorial kind of thing. But um, there's just so much that often gets overlooked. And another mistake is teachers just thinking that every student is going to be a younger version of themselves. And more often than not, you know, if you and I are the 1% and every teacher listening to this is the 1% of people that didn't give up lessons when they were a kid or as they were growing up or with a, you know, even rarer people that practice every day. For most people, you know, guitar playing is going to be something that they do. I, I've got a, a student who's a lawyer. Guitar is his one hour of him, of him uh, to himself for the week. So, you know, he doesn't practice and I don't have the expectation that he practices. He comes in, he picks it up. He hasn't progressed much in, in two years or so, but he can't do anything like that. I've got a student who's a lawyer and he only can do one hour a week. He doesn't practice and we don't expect that he practices. So part of what we do when students come in is we go, hey, why are you here? What do you want to learn? What are you hoping to get out of lessons? And it's important to ask the parents that as well. And, and like what you said, parents are saying, yeah, we want them to have a hobby. We want them to build skills like discipline and perseverance and things like that. But for some reason, it gets distracted about how much practice do you do? And yeah, practicing is important, but it's not the be all and end all. And us being those 1% teachers, yeah, we found it really easy often to practice um, two or three hours a day. In fact, some of us may, uh, and this isn't me, so I can't relate to it because I was six hours a day from day one. But a lot of teachers probably didn't like piano that much as kids. And then when they turned 14 or 15, music became important. And then they decided, hey, this is what I want to do. And then uh, they took off from there. So I was one of those people. Yeah. So yeah. sometimes you need to put yourself in the shoes of, you know, you, your younger self or other people and go, hey, not everyone's willing to commit a couple of hours a day to this um, like I was. But maybe if I make it fun and nurture them and set them up for success the right way and build that appreciation and love for it, then before long, what will happen is they'll get to the point where it clicks and then they make that decision for themselves. And when they're engaged and motivated, that's where it just takes off. Mm. You were talking at the start about the classical tradition uh, and how many teachers teach how, as they were taught, as I did when I first started teaching. One of your points that you wanted to talk about today was classical conservatism versus embracing change in contemporary music. Is that something that we could segue to now as part of that? Yeah, that, that, that would work out perfectly. And that lines up with teachers teaching things the same way they've always been taught and a complete disconnect with who the person in front of you is. And uh, I think guitar in one sense is probably more contemporary dominated than most other instruments just because it's, you know, been one of the most popular instruments for almost, you know, 100 years now. Um, ever, ever since the Beatles and Bill Haley and rock and roll, it's sort of dominated popular culture. But a lot of um, teachers, and when I say conservative classicism, in guitar it's almost like a jazz 
can replace the classical in terms of the academia. The academics tend to generate, uh, gravitate towards jazz music, but there's obviously this idea of saying, hey, this is what you need to be a guitar player. This is how you should be. This is how it's taught. This is how you should learn. And it has a heavy emphasis on learning how to read music, understanding music theory. And, you know, uh, you go to university, you study, you become a high school teacher, that's it. Or, you know, some of you will lecture at universities and, and that's what you do. And it's about, you know, conserving the art. And while there's nothing wrong with that, as we've mentioned before, and I'm probably going to say a hundred other times now, is how many people are you putting off music by trying to come down hard and enforce strict practice and make sure everything's perfectly done or that you're trying to get kids who have never heard Mozart or Beethoven to learn Mozart and Beethoven when what they want to do is learn movie theme songs and things like that. Yeah, sure, teach them classical music, but if you teach them the of the Avengers theme, which is still orchestras and, and things like that and following most of the same principles that our classical composers outlined, then they're going to be much more engaged than trying to teach them a whole bunch of stuff they just got no interest in learning. Yeah, that's certainly something that I've been um, encouraging for some time for teachers. And I know piano teachers, it's been really interesting discussing the differences and similarities between guitar and piano teaching with you over the last uh, few months as we've been working towards this project, uh, and I did, you know, notice that one of those the differences that you've you've said is that yes, there are that group of guitar teachers that are similar to piano teachers in that they have that very traditional classical um, approach. But then you've also got this very contemporary set who will teach the chords and the pop and the tabs straight up uh, as well. And so, I think one of the important things to mention is that we both are very strong believers in making sure that whatever we teach, it's holistic and it's rounded. So we're not saying that we shouldn't teach uh, class, any sort of classical music or sight reading or all those things. It's about balancing the approach and when you do those things, right? Yeah, and I think I mentioned to you a, a, uh, in, a, in a previous call just thinking of the traditional academic approach to teaching is like being book smart whereas the contemporary approach is about being a bit more street smart. And often with guitar teaching, the average guitar teacher comes from a street smart background where they're more into playing and jamming and rocking out with others. And they're, they're career musicians who are doing teaching on the side, whereas a lot more piano teachers and classical background go through an academic kind of thing. They go to university and they study, and they might not necessarily be as active in their performance, but they're obviously a lot more active in their educational side of things um, and and the structure of the classical background and the academic background. So, you know, is one more correct than the other? Not really. And both, uh, you know, the teacher is the teacher. It's completely up to you as to which, which method you want to do or what, what you want to take or how you want to work about it. So every individual is completely capable of going both ways, but it's more about making a decision so they can bo go both ways or choose the best from each field or, you know, make a dynamic. I love this word dynamic, just basically adapting what you need to suit the person in front of you. And uh, classical teachers can learn a lot from contemporary programs and contemporary people can learn a lot from the classical side of things as well. Ultimately, who says you have to be one or the other? And why can't we be questioning, do we have to go in this structure or do we have to go in that structure? Why can't we just take what's working from here, take what's working from here and blend it into a modern super method. And that's essentially what I did with uh, Melbourne Guitar Academy and Guitar Ninjas is just cherry pick the best bits from a whole bunch of different fields, including beyond music teaching, like sports science and martial arts and video games and learning psychology and a whole bunch of things like that. Super method. I like it. <laughs> One of the things you also have been talking about is with, when laying out a clear path for your students is setting goals. So have you got a couple of quick tips about goal setting? Oh, 100%. We could do a whole podcast on goal setting because it's one of my favorite things. But ultimately, you need to start with the end in mind and you need to help paint a picture of your students, whatever that happens to be. And this is where it comes back to what we talked about previously, getting to know your students, getting to know what makes them tick and what they want to get out of it, and then creating that ideal lesson program and breaking it back. And the, the easiest analogy I can give is if you're going to go on a holiday, but week one, you arrive at destination A, and then at the end of the week, you decide the next town or city you're going to go to, and the next town or city, you're like, who knows where you're going to end up? And that's unfortunately how most 
music teachers run their lessons. They just they rock up and they say, what do you feel like learning today, little Timmy? And the, little Timmy goes, oh, I don't know, Miss Margaret. And she goes, all right, well, while you play me what you did last week, I'll try and figure out something for this week. And that really is a great disservice for the student. Whereas if we say, um, all right, Bob, what do you want to do? And he goes, oh, I just want to sit around the campfire and play some things around Christmas time with my mates. And you go, awesome, awesome. So what kind of music do you like? And he goes, oh, I really like my classic Aussie pub rock, bit of ACDC, bit of this. And you go, awesome. So what we need to do is focus on the 20% of skills that you're going to use 80, 20, 80, 20% or 80% of the time. So you don't need to learn sight reading. You don't need to learn a whole bunch of music theory. You don't need to learn you know, classical fingerstyle technique. You need to know chords. You need to know uh, the key theory of how progressions are put together. And you need technique a technical ability to be able to do that at the level which is going to allow that. So you essentially just ask what the end goal is and go, all right, well, let's say we need to learn 10 songs for a good campfire jam session. We pick 10 songs, we stratify what are the most common chords within those 10 songs and the techniques which are going to jump out and then all of a sudden we've got a really clear path. Month number one, we're going to learn this and before that we need to learn this and before that we need to learn this and you keep going, what is the next step? And all of a sudden you have a, a bigger picture roadmap or blueprint of where you need to go and then you just need to select what you're going to work on in each lesson or each month that accommodates that. And that means ignoring a whole bunch of stuff which isn't relevant to the goals of that particular student. At that time because they often change. That's what I find with my students. Anyway, um, what about the students that say, uh, I don't know, I just kind of want to play? Yeah, well, again, you just keep on probing and you just make suggestions until they tell you a little bit of what they want to learn. Now, with kids, they obviously don't know because they don't know. So then it becomes your job as a teacher to find things that inspire them and that they're going to click with and enjoy. So, yeah, I, I say it's important to have a general blueprint. Uh, blueprint and I would say, uh, I've narrowed it down within my own field to say, hey, there's the studio musician, so the session musician, there's the campfire player, there's the singer-songwriter. I basically created a whole personality test. And what I've got is just like an archetype of, you know, what are the core skills that you would need as this kind of player? And what are the core skills you would need as that kind of player? That's a really cool approach. That's cool. Uh, it's a, a absolutely fantastic approach. Um, not to toot my own horn of that, but it, it, it just <laughs> works so well. And it's like it works so well in all these other fields. You know, you go and do a business course, they're going to do like a, a Myers-Briggs personality type or a disc profile kind of thing and work out your personality and then go, here's the things you need to do to optimize your performance and here's what you need to do to work better with other people. So all I'm doing is taking these concepts and doing like a guitar personality quiz or like a, a guitar destiny kind of quiz and then going, well, if this is the kind of play you are, this is what you should focus on. And as you said, you tweak it along the way. I, I remember just being a rock guitar player and then my dad took me to see um, Buddy Guy one night and then all of a sudden I wanted to be a blues guitar player. So we had to pivot and accommodate some of those things. But at the end of the day, this is where 80-20 principle and the, and the magic of Pareto comes in because it doesn't matter what kind of guitar player you are, 20% of the core skills get used 80% of the time. So if you know your fretboard really well, if you understand – the theory and how it ties together on the guitar and you have the technical facility to execute what you hear in your head because you understand the theory and where the notes are, then you can go into whatever field of guitar playing that you need. So we just need to focus on those fundamentals, drill those, get really good at those, and then we just tweak to adapt whatever you know specialty areas we need. I think I'm going to have to listen back to this episode to go through and <laughs> pick up all these things you're saying. This is like Value Bomb City. This is amazing insight michael and i know we're going quite fast um but i know there's heaps more opportunity that we're going to unpack these with our guitar teachers in particular and our top music pro members in general because we've just got so much to learn from you and it's just such a fresh approach i really like that idea of the diagnostic tool that you can use to help students work out where they want to get to and then what is that 20 percent that's going to give them the 80 percent to get to their goal i think that is really a great thing that teachers can take away from today's episode yeah, and it, there's one little thing to add on to that. Just whenever you're teaching something, take a moment to ask yourself, how is this relevant to what I'm doing? You know, exactly what you, you think about in your nine maths class when you're like, sir, when would I ever need to use this in real life? <laughs> and, you know, I remember he was explaining quadratic equations in, in, in your 10 maths class. I'm like, sir, when would we ever need to use this in real life? He goes, um, if you're an engineer who builds bridges or if you're a maths teacher teaching year 10 maths. <sighs> And I was like, 
Great answer. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Way to then, inspire. Then, yeah. And I was just like, okay, well, that's kind of pointless. And then, but then asking in, in my lesson and my method approach, there's no fat in there. There's nothing that you don't need relevant to real life playing. And I can definitely take people and, and students with specialist interests down very deep rabbit holes. But if you are just teaching out of a method book or because your teacher taught you that and you haven't stopped to go, is this the best use of my time or the best use of my students' time? Or why are we even doing this? Yeah, I might use have used this in one piece 12 years ago. Like then then why are you doing it? Focus on the essential skills and come back to your point. I have something called the cycle of positivity. So basically when kids, especially with kids, when the student finds it easy, then they enjoy it. When they enjoy it, they're motivated. When they're motivated, they practice. When they practice, it makes it easy and it sounds good and it feels good. And you just keep going around that cycle where if you give them the right thing in the right order at the right time and they keep getting this sense of achievement and they can do it, then this is how we artificially manufacture success and self-belief and create insanely good musicians in a very, very short period of time. Learning guitar is not a rocket science. Becoming good at an instrument is not a rocket science. There's a process you can do, just like a, an AFL football player follows a fitness routine to shake their body a certain way and get the, the, the skills and the the, uh, the personal fitness levels required for AFL or elite performance athletes. We can do the same thing in our music lessons by having a process for every single concept, for every single skill, and then just following that process. And sometimes you need to make adjustments for people who are kinesthetic learners or audio learners or visual learners or use a bunch of analogies to help it make sense. But you focus on the core skills, you have processes to make it work uh, amazingly well. And then if you do everything right and make it easy for the student, then they just get that confidence and that momentum behind them. And they just take off and all of a sudden you're training a whole bunch of virtuosos. Oh, our top music pro members, they're going to have so much fun learning with you. I can just tell. <laughs> it's just so good to hear this uh, this approach. I should actually mention too, um, you've mentioned AFL and footy a few times. So for, yeah. for all our North American and non-Australian listeners, this is the Australian rules football. So this is our football code over here. You mentioned Gary Ablett, I think, in part one as well. No one's probably going to know that outside Australia. Yeah, Gary Ablett's like the, the Tom Brady or the LeBron James of... Uh... Our, of our, our code. code. Yep. <laughs> Sheep Music Plus is the home of the world's largest selection of sheet music. Offering more than 2 million titles, you'll find everything you need for your students, for yourself, and for every group you play with. Shop, songbooks, classical repertoire, and piano methods all conveniently shipped to your front door. At Sheet Music Plus, you can also choose from hundreds of thousands of digital scores that you can download and play instantly, perfect for lessons and last minute needs. And best of all, teachers are eligible to get 8% cash back on all purchases with the Sheet Music Plus Easy Rebates program. Shop today at sheetmusicplus.com. All right, I want to talk about, even if we wouldn't admit it, we all know we have good and bad students. Well, we, you know, we think of this student as this is a good one and this one's a bit of a bad, you know, I don't know. Really you like to reframe this as engaged and disengaged, and you've got some tips on how to get more engagement. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, 100%. So ultimately, if you have bad students, and it's not going to feel good to hear this, but you are the problem. <laughs> In 90% of the cases, you are the problem if, you t- if your students aren't enjoying their lessons or they're not fun to teach. Now, the good news is that if you're the problem, you are also the solution. So All you need to do is change yourself and change your approach. And the way I like to think about it is you don't have good students and bad students because how often do we have someone that's an absolute top student and then they just lose interest or they stop practicing or something in their life goes on and all of a sudden, you know, they become what we would call a bad student and vice versa. How many people have we suffered through teaching and, you know, hours of clock watching and then all of a sudden you show them ACDC or, you know, that they, that they're old cousin learns guitar as well. Now they're motivated and then they just become that kid that practices three hours every day. So it's not good and bad students. It's engaged students and disengaged students. And engaged students are, you know, actively thinking about the learning. They enjoy it. They love their lessons. They've got a future that they're working towards and disengaged students essentially just there because their parents want them to be there or they're filling in time or whatever it happens to be. So how do you make students engage? Well, You need to have high energy. You need to make lessons fun and interactive. You need to make it relevant to them because ultimately if they can't see why it's relevant, just like me in maths class, hey, sir, why would we be doing this 
oh, you know why we're practicing this scale? Because if we use our scales really well, then we can improvise with it and write songs. And, and you, you want to write your own songs, don't you? Yeah. So here's how we take the scale and extrapolate all the music theory knowledge from that and then make things out of it. Or, you know, if, if you don't play games in your guitar lessons, you are seriously doing yourself and a student a great disservice. So what kind of games are you playing, musical or otherwise, in your lessons? Pardon me, to make them really, really fun. And ultimately, just using simple things like gamification, which is, you know, what I get from video games, especially mobile games and things like that, is everything's about the next dopamine hit or about the reward or, or leveling up. And a lot of people will ultimately, sorry, I'll back up a step, like the reality of becoming good at an instrument is you need to repeat the same monotonous movements thousands, if not tens of thousands of times. What we unfortunately have students do is they'll do it the bare minimum. They'll do it three times and go, yep, I'm done, which are my two least favorite words, I'm done. So at our studio, there's no such thing as done. That's one of the, the, the classroom rules is there is no such thing as done. And what we would rather do, and this becomes a game and a method of gamification, is rather than just let them practice, we say, all right, you're going to do a set number of repetitions as if you're a high performance athlete, or you're going to do a certain amount of time. So, you know, you can't be done unless you are doing really, really high amounts of repetition, in which case you just go, all right, well, let's go for the stretch goals and things like that. So we will also use things like checklists and challenges. So, and with our group lessons, say if you've got two students uh, or you've got three students and they're all different levels, what I can do is say, okay, guys, We've got five levels to what we're doing. We've got to play this scale. Step number one is you're going to play it ascending. So you just need to go from low to high. Level number, you've got to do that 10 times. Step number two, you've got to do it descending. So you've got to do it the other way 10 times. Level number three is you've got to do it standing up. So you need to have your guitar strap, you need to stand up. So now all of a sudden the student is repeating it a lot more times, but it's fun because it's challenges. And they're also getting the perspective of, yeah, it's very different to be sitting down versus standing up. And then if they can complete that challenge, then what they have to do is do it with their eyes shut. So they need to do it 10 times with their eyes shut. And then that's training a different skill. And then if they can do that, they have to pair up and play it in time with another person or to a metronome or, you know, I've got a list of, you know, 30, 40 odd challenges that me or any of my staff can drop on a student at any one point in time to test their knowledge. And again, it's not done because if I say, if you know a scale, but you can't play it in all 12 keys starting from any of the, the scale degrees, or you can't improvise with it, or you can't apply this sequence, then you know of it, but you don't really know it. So we just use gamification as a test, but also as a challenge to go, all right, what can you do next? Where can you take this? And the students don't even realize it. We're secretly maniacally plotting to get them to do tens of thousands of repetitions because it's disguised as a game. And that way they're all super highly motivated and ready to get to that next level. Yeah, Philip Johnston, who you may remember speaking at uh, Piano Pivot Live, he has uh, a lot of gamification because he's a high-level taekwondo, I think it's taekwondo, coach and academy owner. And he's always gamifying all the stuff that he does in music lessons. And he's, if you've ever read any of his books, and the listeners out there may have read The Practice Revolution and um, similar books, uh, he's got another book called Scale, Scales Boot Camp, and it does exactly what you've just said. It's just increasing levels of challenge for all the scales until it's like eyes shut and, um, you know, upside down on the piano keyboard and, you know, things like, like it goes to the nth degree, but it does help motivate because it takes the uh, thinking off the, that I'm repeating this again and again to, oh, there's a new element here that I'm going to try and conquer. I, I think it's a great approach. And I know we've got lots more to talk about when it comes to gamification in the future. <laughs> Yeah, every single thing that Tim gets excited about, he's going to write a list at the end and we're just going to create content. We are, I know. <laughs> <for that day. laughs> this, this episode is just a little teaser, guys. So if you're listening out there and you're like, oh, I want to learn more about this, then definitely stay tuned to the Top Music blog uh, and Inside Membership. We're going to be sharing lots more content on this. I want to change tack and talk about money. Now, a lot of, for a lot of music teachers, there's this sense that money is an evil thing and it's bad if we ask for more and... I think you might have a, some tips for teachers on that. 100%. Um, the most important thing I did was change my mindset and attitude towards money. And I was, um, I never thought money was bad, but I failed to realize the power of money and compound interest and simply that money is a resource that allows you to have a, a, the life that you want if you have enough money to pay for it. And, you know, 
the best example I can give is, you know, think of someone you care about and now think, what would you be able to do tomorrow if they came to you and said that they've just had a really bad medical diagnosis and they need $250,000 for the treat? Most of us are probably going to say, oh, well, I can't help you. My thoughts and prayers are with you. I really wish I could do something, but I can't. And knowing that about and thinking about members of my family was a really big burning desire to actually get my stuff together and, and get organized and take on a new financial perspective. And again, I wanted to be in a touring band, uh, a self-funded touring band. So a tour costs at least $30,000, you know, split that six ways between members. You can you know pay five grand each, but if we wanted the big ones, they're obviously hundred thousand dollar investments. So you can complain about, Oh yeah, only these guys get the opportunities or we're not signed to label or this, this and that. But essentially if you were self-funded and you had the money, you'd be competing against labels anyway. So it's just having a general awareness that most of us don't understand how money works because the education system hasn't told us how it works. And that most of us don't question whether, you know, who says you have to go to university, study for three years, and then go into an organized job where you're capped at $60,000 a year or less, depending on where you are in the world. I think uh, $40,000 US is probably about $60,000 Australian or something equivalent. So when I say $60,000, that's probably like a, a $40,000 high school teacher's job over in the States. But most of us go, well, that's the way it is. This is the cap on what I can learn rather than going, hang on, what do I actually want to learn and what do I want to do? Do I want to be working 20 hours a week so I can put the best part of my hours into my music career? Do I want to be able to teach remotely from a really nice Hawaiian island kind of deal so I can live in paradise and teach? The problem is most people just accept the fact that earn this much lessons are $20 or $50 an hour and away you go. And that, that private lessons is the only model that you need to follow. So for me, it was just realizing that money was a tool to be used. It's not good or bad. Uh, it just completely amplifies who you are, but it gives you the ability to look after your family, to have a high quality of life for yourself. And ultimately, if you're having a better life and you are a better version of you, then your students get the benefit of learning from that better version of you. And the person I am now can help people significantly more than the person I was you know, five, six years ago when I was earning $16,000, $18,000 a year tops, I can just do so much more and help so many more people. Mm. Yeah, I think a lot of teachers, because they start to, when they're quite young, in many cases, they will sensibly just go around and go, okay, what was my teacher charging and what do other teachers in the area charge? And I'll charge that rather than thinking, okay, where do I want to get to and how much do I need to charge and how many hours do I want to work in order to get there? Uh, so completely reframing it from the the goal end. It's a little bit like what you do with your students. All I did to get where I was was set a financial goal and then work out what I would have to do to get that goal. And then I just worked the plan. And that's essentially what it is. Uh, if you could distill any sort of advice in business or even teaching or money, it's simply going, what, it, what is it you want to make? Set the target break it down into an achievable goal, and then you just have to take action to make it happen. And uh, there's a great quote saying, it only takes time, but time is all it takes. You just need to stick with it and not deviate from it and keep making um, investments or keep leveling up. And eventually you'll get there, whether your goal is to earn an extra $10,000 a year, an extra $50,000 a year, or to be earning $100,000 a year. But the other mistake most people make, like what you said, is they only charge what their teachers charge or they feel kind of bad about charging money so they undervalue themselves but we as musicians we spend 10,000 hours into getting good at our instrument we spend a whole you know another 30,000 50,000 dollars for those of us who have degrees learning how to study and then teach our instrument and we put more hours or just as many hours as a brain surgeon does to become a brain surgeon or a lawyer becomes does to become a lawyer but for whatever reason we put all this time and effort in, but we don't see it as as valuable. Whereas often we can be just as impactful, if not more important to those kind of people, to a broader amount and a range of people. So don't undervalue yourself. Don't be afraid to charge what you think you're worth and then stick to your guns. And yeah, you can always make exceptions for people that genuinely need it, who aren't financially well off or um, people that just don't have the means to pay for things. But if you're charging what you think you can charge based off of your inexperienced and you're charging a little bit less or that this is what your teacher used to charge, so you're going to charge it too, you're really doing yourself a great disservice. And most people 
they just underestimate how much people will actually pay for lessons when they value quality. And here's a, a common concept for people, the fact that there's things called market segments. So there's going to be people, no matter what, always go for the lowest price. There's going to be people, no matter what, instantly go for the highest price. And then, of course, there's going to be the majority of people in the middle. So I would always say you need to target your price setting somewhere in the middle to the upper range. You know, if you want to be like everyone else, just charge like everyone else. But, but if you charge a little bit more, it doesn't have to be the highest in the market, but a little bit more of a premium, you generally get a higher quality of customer. And when I stopped doing $20 lessons and driving to people's houses, I lost all of my headachey customers. When I charged uh, you know, a higher price, we got people who would stick to lesson policies, who were happy to pay for makeup no, they didn't bust your ass about makeup lessons or, um, you know, they didn't get upset about your policy and things like that because, you know, they respect time. They're obviously professionals themselves and they understand that, hey, you know, I'm a doctor. If no one rocks up, we still charge them. That's perfectly fine for you to do that as a guitar teacher as well. So the higher you charge, the better quality of people that you can do. The only one rule is you need to be providing the value to match that price. You can't just charge $100 an hour and then continue to teach out of a room where people have to walk through empty beer bottles and smell like cigarettes <laughs> and the cat's thrown up on the floor. You need to actually provide the value. But price is only an objection in the absence of value. And you just think of, you know, people will complain playing about $20 lessons but have a $3,000 tattoo on their arm. So there's also going to be people that want the best for their children no matter what. And, you know, how much it costs this? Cool, sign me up. It's, so don't have any preconceived ideas about money. Charge what you're worth or what you think you're worth. Provide the value and then hopefully tie that into what are your goals and how many students or how many customers do you need to get you that goal. And then, you know, if, if for you, all you want to do is earn $30,000 a year teaching and that covers your living expenses and you can go out and play, if that's success to you, fantastic. But most people, including myself, can easily earn $100,000 teaching 20 hours a week, which is, you know, more than double what you get in a uh, community thing where you get to be your own boss, you get to live a, a life of a lot more freedom and make a lot more money. And most people just either don't believe you it's possible or they're just super skeptical that you must be scamming people. They feel too bad to ask for more money. And that's that's not even doing really, really high prices there. Uh, and the other flip side of that is, you know, I was at $200,000 at one point. Um, we're now chasing down our target of a uh, million dollars a year through our teaching business. But when I was doing $200,000 just by myself, you know, it was cool for like three or four months where I was like, man, I'm making so much money. This is awesome. And then it became unsustainable to the point where I wasn't my best because I was run down. So you know, you might be content making $50,000 a year because it gives you the lifestyle that you want. You might be on your way to earning half a million or a million dollars a year, but you've got to be willing to take on the stress of running a business, of managing staff, of having to lease commercial properties that goes along with that. So there's no one size fits all. It's what works for you, but you need to figure out that what you believe about money and your capability might be limited by your own beliefs. Wow. There was a cool quote in there about, um, what was it, the value, uh, something in the absence of value is when you get price objections. What was that quote? Price is only an objection in the absence of value. Yeah, that's, that's, um, that's, I really like that. Yeah. And we have to get better uh, and I'm always working as well uh, in my own business about helping people understand the value that we provide or try and provide. And we have to do that in our studios as well. Uh, Michael, I'm conscious of the time um, and I'm going to wrap things up soon. I did have two other little things on the list which we might be able to cover in one maybe. Um, one was your views on teaching versus training and secondly, my way or the highway. And I think we might have covered the my way or the highway um, thing a little bit earlier with regard to finding what students want and setting their goals and things like that. But should we wrap up with either or both of those two? Yeah, let's see if we can tackle both of them. In short succession, um, <laughs> this is going to sound silly. I completely blanked out on what the first one was. It was uh, training versus teaching. Training versus teaching. So, yeah, as teachers, we make the mistake that we need to teach all the time. And of course, our parents are always like, "Hey, little Jimmy, what did you learn today?" He goes, "I learned this." And the next week, "Hey, little Jimmy, what did you learn today?" And you learn this. But I always use the analogy of saying, "Hey, Tim, I made you a sandwich," and then you take a bite out of that sandwich. You go, "Hey, Tim, I made you another sandwich." 
and another sandwich, another sandwich. And before you know, you've got all these half-eaten sandwiches lying around the house going moldy because you've never actually finished anything off. And that's what most people like with their songs. Um, with guitar, we generally have a bigger emphasis on learning songs and things like that within the contemporary style. But it's almost heartbreaking to have students come in for their free trial with me and I go, okay, you've been learning for two years, play me a song. And they can't play a song. They can play me a whole bunch of different pieces of songs. They can play me the easy bits of the songs before they put them in the too hard basket. But the amount of people that start guitar do a year or more of lessons, particularly in primary schools where they're doing, you know, 30 minute lessons once a week, they just, they have nothing to show for it. It's actually really, really heartbreaking. So part of what I do and I teach all my instructors to do is our job is to be teachers, but we're also coaches and mentors. And part of that is we introduce a topic. We need to teach it so that the student knows what it is, but you have to go through a revision phase where they go back and relearn it. Then we go through an integration phase where we have to show them how what they learned fits into the, the bigger picture. And we also have to have an application phase. So for example, if I teach them a scale, I might need to integrate that with a sequence. So all of a sudden they're going one, two, three, four, two, three, four, five, da, 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 da. Or, hey, can we integrate this with the legato technique and play it with legato. So all of a sudden they're connecting a whole bunch of different skills and this works in terms of making sure that they can connect the different nodes in their brains and, and really consolidate and solidify that information, but also that they can see the practical application and how it works. And then of course we get the application where, okay, we learn a scale, but let's actually put on a backing track and have some fun and jam over it. And, you know, for me, the first three years of my guitar playing in high school was here's a scale. You need to be able to play that at your assessment in six months' time, or you've got to play this in your exam when they ask you to play it. Make sure you can play it. And that was all we did with scales. No one ever taught me that I could make a melody or that my licks came from these scales or that if I was writing a song, this is the scale that's going to allow me to create what I need to be the melody or to harmonize things. So much is overlooked, and this isn't a rant on, the, the again, the exam system or anything like that, but we want to go beyond the means of just giving students things to pass a test and actually show them what it means to put it in a musical context and to be a musician and to use it. And that means you teach them one concept. There are things that I learned five years ago that I'm still working on and expanding today. How are you going to get a seven-year-old <laughs> to learn one topic in one 30 minute lesson and have it forever. You got to keep on revisiting things. You got to keep on showing them how to apply to new contexts, keep on building layers on top of it. And uh, again, if uh, maybe, maybe to segue into the my way or the highway kind of approach is you've got to consolidate everything down to who that student is. If you're trying to force students to sight read, if you're trying to make students learn classical because you're a classical guitar player, but they want to learn pop stuff, or if you're just saying, yep, we've got to do exams and you've got to practice an hour every day and be super military about it, then what's going to happen is students going to quit. If it's too hard, if it's not fun, especially these this day and age where everyone's got the attention span of five seconds thanks to Facebook and their total dopamine junkies looking for easy wins, you need to set yourself up in a way that's conducive to long-term learning, that's fun and engaging so that the student wants to come and doesn't see any negative aspects because, you know, we're programmed to take the path of least resistance and most kids who don't normally have much resilience, resilience at a young age, let alone what's been exacerbated by screen time and, and games and things like that, if you're not making it fun and engaging or you're coming down too hard, then you're going to lose students and you're going to lose money and then you're going to need to come in and join our course and learn how to run a business properly <laughs> and change your mindset and value money and all those kind of things because you know you, you either need to embrace the change and use it to your advantage or you're just going to become forgotten and that's a big part of probably why classical music within the guitar context really isn't that popular at all because it's just so disassociated and disconnected but if you're trying to you know even teach things 40 years ago, rock and roll stuff, which is, you know, really your favorite genre of music, it's still going to be disconnected to some degree with the students until you get some, to that point where they want to become guitar players. When they're at that point, you can do almost anything with them and they'll love it and enjoy it. But you need to make it relevant, otherwise you're going to lose them.
Well, Michael's been madly creating courses and content galore, workshops, downloads, lesson plans, curricula that we are going to be sharing inside Top Music Pro membership for guitar teachers, which is one of the most exciting launches we've had uh, of recent years. We'll be sharing more details about that in the coming weeks. But uh, firstly, thank you very much, Michael, for your insights today. It's great to uh, hear those. Um, and if you want to learn more, then make sure you check out our show notes page and listen to my intros and outros about how you can get on the wait list uh, for guitar teachers joining Top Music Pro with our guitar program. Um, and if you know of any guitar teachers who aren't currently connected with us, then please share this episode and let them know about us so that they can connect with Michael um, and grab some of these tips and also the tips we're going to be talking about next week. So in part three of our series with Michael, it's a guitar teacher's focus. So this is going to be the episode that we want as many guitar teachers around the world to listen to as, as we possibly can. We're going to be talking about common mistakes, what guitar methods get wrong, in Michael's opinion, some more about gamification, mindset shifts, particularly for guitar teachers, sight reading, private versus group lessons, all the good stuff. Michael, thanks again for joining us today. We'll see you next week. Thank you for having me, Tim. Looking forward to next week. Well, what did you think of part two? Some ideas for you there, hopefully? maybe some controversy, whatever it is, we'd love to hear from you on any of our social media channels. Send us an email, support at topmusic.co or head to our show notes page for this episode. That's topmusic.co slash episode 255 and you're more than welcome to leave a comment under the blog post there, which is also where you can get all your links and downloads and everything that you need from today's episode. All right, next week we finish our three-part series with looking at some strategies for teaching and business specifically now for guitar teachers. And as I said, right back in the intro to part one, while this is very specific to, or while we're angling this towards guitar teachers, it really does involve lots of strategies and ideas that will be relevant to teachers of any instrument. And I have to say that one thing I have learned most from is actually engaging with teachers of other instruments. It's, uh, it's amazing what you can learn from teachers of other instruments and apply to whatever instrument it is that you're teaching. It's the same thing that you can really get uh, a lot from learning an instrument other than the one that you actually play too. I remember when I did that with trumpet and trombone, and to some extent guitar too. It's a great experience to be put back in that beginner's seat. So uh, I hope you'll join me regardless of what instrument you teach for part three next week. Until then, I'm Tim Topham, and this is the Topcast. Can't wait to see you again next week. Bye-bye. For more information about this episode and to find out how to enhance your own teaching, visit topmusic.co. You'll find everything you need for your studio, from lesson plans to cheat sheets, quick win teaching ideas and guides on how to build your teaching business. Plus, you'll be connected to a global community of the world's top music teachers. And when you're ready, join hundreds of other teachers around the world by becoming a Top Music Pro member and get access to all our bonus content and flagship courses. And don't forget to follow topmusic.co on social media and subscribe to this podcast wherever you listen to it. That's all for today. We'll see you in the studio.